a special welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure as we come together to study the Word of God. My name is James Murray. I'm one of the elders from the Port St. Lucie Church on Tulip Avenue in Port St. Lucie. I am happy to be on the WEHR radio. That stands for Eternal Hope. And today, I am presenting this message of eternal hope to you. Our topic for discussion is what the Bible teaches about communication with God. And so we are going to go. Before we talk about that, we would just like to pray. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to study with your people. Bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our first question as we go into our Bible study is, how do we communicate with God? Have you ever thought about that? How do we communicate with God? Well, Let us read from Daniel chapter 9 and verse 3. And I hope you have your Bibles with you, or you can write the passages down, and you can go and read them afterward. So Daniel 9 and verse 3, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And it says, Then I turn my face to the Lord God, seeing him, seeking him by prayer, and please and pleas for mercy and fasting with sackcloth and ashes. Let me read that same passage in the uh, NIV. And it says, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. So we notice that our answer for this question, there are three things. Fasting and prayer in in uh, sackcloth and in ashes. I'm going to deal with prayer in a few minutes. So let me look at the word supplication. What do you think supplication means? Now here, let us talk about it for a minute. It says supplication is an action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. Now, fasting is abstaining from eating for a period of time. Now, when we fast, it is an outward expression of an inward commitment to pursue God. I know you don't see individual using sackcloth and ashes in these years, but according to my research, sackcloth and ashes were used in Old Testament times as a symbol of debasement, mourning, and or repentance. Someone wanting to show his repentant heart would often wear sackcloth and ashes, and they would sit in the ashes and put ashes on top of his or her head. Sackcloth was a coarse material, usually made of black goat's hair, making it quite uncomfortable to wear. The ashes signify desolation and ruin. Sackcloth and ashes were used as an outward sign of one's inward condition. Such a symbol made one's change of heart visible and demonstrated the sincerity of one's grief and or repentance. It was not that it was not the act of putting on sackcloth and ashes itself that moved God to intervene, but the humility that such an action demonstrated. Let me say that again. It was not the act of putting on the sackcloth or the ashes itself that moved God to intervene, but the humility that such an action demonstrated. So when one humbles themselves before God, then God would hear their prayer. God would move with action and that would help. Let us look at question number two. What is prayer. We're going to turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 to 15. 1 Samuel 1, 9 to 15. And it says, So 
Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maid servant and remember me and not forget your maid servant but will give your maid servant a male child then i will give him to the lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head Verse 12 says, And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Anna spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Verse 14, So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicated drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. I want you to notice something. Notice what Hannah said. I have poured out my soul to the Lord. She talked openly to the Lord. So we notice that Hannah poured out her soul to the Lord. And in the book, Step to Christ, chapter 11, it says that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. We notice that Hannah poured out herself. She poured out her heart to God. So when you pray, it's like pouring out your soul, talking to God, telling him what's on your mind, what is bothering you, what you would like him to know. That was what Hannah was doing, pouring out her heart to the Lord. And the, the chapter in Step to Christ says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. So let us go over to question number three. Question number three says, how much power does sincere prayer have? We turn our Bibles to James chapter 5 and verse 16. So when you turn your Bibles to James chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, and I'm reading from the New International Version, it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And the last part of that text says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now let me read that same passage from the King James Version. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be healed. And then the last part says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I want you to notice something in this passage. It states that we must always confess our sins to each other. If someone say something or we have an art against someone, we must try to confess, get to ask for forgiveness to our brothers and sisters before we come to God in prayer. Because we have to make sure that we do not keep malice or envy or grudge in our heart with each other. So we must confess our faults one to another and pray for 
each other that we may be healed. Now, the last part also answers our question. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, who is a righteous person? Who do you think is a righteous person? According to the dictionary, the word righteous means to be right, especially in a moral way. Let's see what the Bible calls righteous or who the Bible calls righteous. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. And I'm, again, I'm using the NIV and it says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. All right. Now, let us look at the King James Version. And or when you look into the King James Version, verse 6 says that he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So, therefore, when you see a righteous person, as in the case of Abraham, what did he do? He believed in God, believed in God, and God counted that to him as righteous. Let's look at another passage and see if we, they're all the same thing or tying in to each other. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, 22 to 24. We notice it is talking about Abraham. And it says, verse 20 says, He staggered not at the promise of God. And this is referring, as I said, to Abraham. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. No, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that the Bible says that it was that Abraham's belief in God, his faith in God, be him being able to trust in God, God counted that to him as righteousness. Now, look at this section in the Bible. It, verse 23, it says, It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. So to my, my friends, as you're listening, if you are believing in God, just like Abraham, if you have that faith in God, just like Abraham, if you put your trust, your faith, your confidence in God, just like Abraham did, the Bible says he will count it to you as righteous and he will see you as righteous. We all can be as righteous as as Abraham, if we put our trust and our confidence in God. When you look at other passages, you will find similar sentiments like in Galatians 3 and verse 6 and James 2 and verse 23. You will find similar sentiments where God refers to to Abraham's faithfulness is trusting him as righteousness. Okay, let us move on to question number four. Question number four says, in whose name should we pray? And the passage that we are going to look at is John 14 verse 13. And it says, and whosoever he shall ask in my name or whatsoever he shall ask in my name that will I do. Let me read that again. And whatsoever he shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14 says, If he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So then, who then should we pray? Whose name should we pray in? According to the Bible, we should ask in Jesus' name. Do you ever wonder why 
we should ask in Jesus' name? Ah, let's look in verse 6 of this same chapter in John 14 and look at verse 6 of the same chapter. We find it says where Jesus is talking now and Jesus was talking to Thomas and Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So here we notice Jesus is the way to God the Father. So that answers our question. This is why when we pray, we pray and we we pray in the name of Jesus. We notice that when we pray, when we're closing, we say in the name of Jesus or through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? As we say, because Jesus says that he is the way. He is the truth and the life. And no one can get to the Father except through him. All right? So I hope that answers that question. Let us move on to our next question. Let's question number five. Does God answer prayer? Matthew 7 and verse 7 to 11. Does God answer prayer? Matthew 7 7 to 11. And I read for you. It says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom, if his son ask bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will give him a serpent? If he then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask of him? Let us look back into this passage. So what does the Bible say that we should do? It says that we should ask and it will be given. Therefore, when we pray, God will answer us our prayer. Up with another question. Does God always answer our prayers? Or why is it that sometimes we may not see an immediate answer to our prayer? Ah, no. Here are some possible readings that may affect us. Now, from the reading in the Bible, we have instances where God will say yes, or sometimes he may say no, or other times he may say wait. Let me give you a few examples. For example, the centurion who asked for the healing of his daughter, he got an instant yes. Paul had an issue with his eyes and prayed three times for healing. And God said that his grace is sufficient for him. Look into 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7 to 10. Now, Paul got a no for his answer. God says that his grace is sufficient for his answer. Let us look at the wait. In the story of Hannah, we read that earlier on. She waited for such a long time before she could get pregnant. Read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And finally, when she was in the temple, when the priest thought she was drunk, and it took so long, other other people were mocking her, and oh, she was so devastated, and it took long. But God did not forget her. God answered her prayer. So you have to understand that God sometimes will take some time to answer our prayer. I want to read some things for you. Here are some other reasons why we may have delays or why our prayers may not answer immediately. I'm going to read a few sections from Steps to Christ, chapter 11. And it says, If we regard iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any known sin, the Lord will not hear us. 
but the prior of the penitent contrite soul is always accepted. You see that? If we regard iniquity in our heart, if we have hatred in our heart, if we don't like individuals, our prayers will not be answered. That is why we say we must always be forgiven. Ask forgiveness from our brothers. That is why the Jesus, when he was teaching, he says we should ask for forgiveness. As we forgive others, Jesus will forgive us. So he says if we regard iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any known sin, the Lord will not hear us. But the prayer of the fair, of the penitent contrite soul is always accepted. Let me read another section here. It says another element of prevailing prayer is faith. If you don't have faith, it is difficult for God to answer your prayer. He says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That is taken from Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Also, Jesus said to his disciples, what things soever he desire, when he pray, believe that he receive them and he shall have them. Mark 11 verse 24. Do we take him at his word? So we have to believe. We have to have that faith in God and he will hear us. The last paragraph I want to read for you. He says, the assurance is broad and unlimited, and he is faithful who has promised. When we do not receive the very things we ask for, at the time we ask, we are still to believe that the Lord hears and that he will answer our prayers. We are to, we are so erring and short-sighted that we sometimes ask for things that would not be a blessing to us. You hear that? Let me say that again. We are so erring and short-sighted that we sometimes ask for things that would not be a blessing to us. And our Heavenly Father in love and answers to our prayer by giving us that which will be for our highest good. That which we ourselves would desire if we vision divinely enlightened, we could see all things as they really are. Are. When our prayers seem not to be answered, we are to cling to the promise for the time of answering will surely come and we shall receive the blessing we need most. But to claim that prayer will always be answered in the very way and for the particular thing that we desire is presumption right? Let me say that again. But to claim that prayer will always be answered in the very way for that particular thing that we desire is presumptuous. So it's not all the time that we ask for things the way we ask for things that God is going to answer it, okay? So God is too wise to err, too good to withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. Then do not fear to trust him. Even though you do not see the immediate answer to your prayer, it says that we should rely upon his pure, upon his sure promises. Ask and it shall be given to you. All right. That is from Step to Christ and that I was reading from chapter 11. Now, one last question before we wrap up. Question number six. How is faith described? Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. And it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh 
to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, my friends, as you see, this answer, the question, how is faith described? So, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, something that you are looking forward to. You don't even see where it is coming from, but because you believe in God, because you trust in him, because you understand God, because you know that God is a promise keeper, you can put your trust trust in him. He says that he will answer your prayer. That is faith. That is putting faith forward that God will hear your prayer. He, he will answer and he will make your request to him. I tell you one short story before I go. My dad was praying one day for a, a suit. He didn't have a suit to go to his culporta function. And he prayed to God that evening for a jacket. He just wanted if he said if he just get a jacket that would go well with him. And he prayed. We had uh, vespers and he prayed. And we were sitting around in the house. And then all of a sudden, the door knocked. And when he looked, it was his son coming from Kingston. And when his son came in, oh, he was so delighted to see him. And he was talking and they were chatting and laughing. And then my my, my brother pulled out us and said, oh, Papa, you know, I have a jacket here for you. My father said, jacket, boy? You were you so foolish? He was so surprised. He couldn't believe that his prayer was answered. That is faith in God. God answered his prayer right there. He got his jacket and he was so happy. His prayer answered. My father could not even believe that his prayer was answered. While he was praying, while he was praying, the jacket was on his way. So when we ask God, when we pray to God, while you are still praying, God is looking for your benefit. So my brothers and my friends, put your trust in God. Don't allow discouragement to take you. Put your faith in him. It says, faith is a confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Right now, we are looking forward to see God's coming in his glory. We do not know when, but we are looking forward to that day. We don't know when, but we believe. Right now, it seems long. It seems so long, but we are still going to have faith in God. We're going to trust him because one of these days, even if I die tonight, I know that because I trust in him, that will not be a death, but a sleep. That because when God comes again, he's going to wake me up and I am going to wake up and I will live with him for eternity when he comes. I hope that will be your prayer that you pray that you can see God's face when he comes and that will be an answer to your prayer. May God bless you as we work together. Father, we just want to thank you for this blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to study your words. Help us to live faithfully so we all can go home home to meet you when you come is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, oh, oh.
Oh, oh, oh.